At this point, we've examined the basic conventions around chemical changes between elements and compounds, and how these changes conform to the laws of conservation of matter and of energy. And now it's time to, to turn our attention to the driving forces for these changes. And those are the relationships between electrons in the atoms. So electron position and interactions govern many of the major properties of both elements and compounds. Position and interactions drive bond formation and chemical reactions. And our understanding of electron structure has developed significantly over the 20th century into our current day model of atomic structure, which is the quantum mechanical model. In order to best understand the quantum mechanical model, though, we have to cover a little bit about the differences between classical physics and quantum mechanics. And the best way to introduce this relative to electron structure is to discuss the dual nature of light, and in the next PowerPoint, the dual nature of matter, specifically electrons. So in classical physics, we consider that light and matter behave in completely distinct ways. Light is energy, and it has the characteristics of waves. It travels as a wave of oscillating electric and magnetic fields. And those waves interact with other waves and with matter in unique ways. They can bend around objects. And when waves meet each other, they can combine together to form new distinct wave patterns. And this is very different from the way we consider matter to behave. Matter, like the baseball depicted here, behaves as particles. And particles travel in very distinct, defined trajectories. When particles collide with each other, they bounce off or change the angle of trajectory and they transfer energy from one substance to another through collisions. Now in contrast to this classical physics distinction between light and matter, quantum theory indicates that the two don't behave quite as differently as we thought. In the early 1900s, Einstein proved that light actually can also behave in particle-like fashion. Then German scientists in the mid-century proved that electrons, as microscopic matter, can also behave in a wave-like manner. This dual nature for both light and for matter opened the door to a new model of the atom that could explain a variety of properties and phenomenon that couldn't be explained by older models. To begin our understanding of these differences, let's start by examining light first. So light behaves as a wave, and waves are regular oscillating patterns of movement that transmit energy. They can be characterized by wavelength, which we usually abbreviate with the Greek letter lambda, And it stands for the distance between two consecutive peaks or between two consecutive troughs in the wave. The base unit for wavelength is usually meters. Waves can also be characterized by frequency. So frequency is abbreviated with the Greek letter nu, which actually looks like a V in italics. And frequency simply stands for the number of wave cycles that pass by a given point in one second. Its base unit is hertz, which is abbreviated HZ, and it essentially stands for cycles per second. Since cycles is a count and doesn't contain a unit, the number of cycles, uh, the actual unit associated with hertz is seconds to the negative one, or one over seconds. And finally, we can characterize waves in terms of amplitude. So amplitude, which is um, abbreviated with a lowercase a, is simply one half the height 
between the wave peak and the wave trough. So amplitude is related to the intensity of the wave. And for light waves, that means the higher the amplitude, the brighter the light. So wavelength times frequency will give you the speed at which that wave is traveling. For light or electromagnetic radiation, it all travels at the same speed in a given medium. So for example, in a vacuum, all light travels at 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. M times seconds to the negative one is another way of saying meters per second. So this mathematical relationship shows us that wavelength and speed are inversely proportional. For larger wavelengths, like that depicted at the top, you have fewer cycles in a second. So you have a lower frequency. If you have a shorter wavelength, like the two wave cycles depicted at the bottom here, you're able to fit in more cycles per second, so you end up with a higher frequency. So as wavelength increases, frequency, or the number of cycles per second, decreases. In the same manner, as wavelength decreases, then frequency, or the number of cycles per second, must increase. So different types of electromagnetic radiation are characterized by different wavelengths or frequencies. And here we have a depiction of the electromagnetic spectrum and some of the applications of different wavelengths or frequencies of light. So for example, gamma rays, x-rays, and ultraviolet light all have short wavelengths and higher frequencies. Visible light, infrared radiation, terahertz radiation, and microwave radiation are all considered intermediate in terms of the wavelength and the frequency associated with them. And at the lower end of the spectrum, we have radio waves, which have very long wavelengths and therefore very low frequencies. At this lower end of the spectrum, uh, radiation is usually characterized by its frequency, while at the higher end of the spectrum, we usually talk about radiation in terms of the wavelength. That's how we describe it. So these are just conventions that have developed over time as we've learned more about different parts of the spectrum. Regardless of whether we characterize radiation by its frequency or its wavelength, all electromagnetic radiation, which includes visible light, can be related in terms of frequency and wavelength through the speed of light. Wavelength times frequency always equals the speed of light, characterized by the variable C here. And the speed of light is 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So let's use this equation to relate frequency to wavelength for radio waves. So one of the frequencies used to transmit and receive cellular telephone signals in the US is 850 megahertz. We wanna know what the wavelength of this radio wave is in meters. So we'll use our equation, the wavelength times the frequency equals C, the speed of light. We'll define our terms. The speed of light that we'll use is 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Wavelength is what we want to find. And nu, or frequency, is 850 megahertz. So in terms of metric prefixes, the prefix mega actually stands for 1 million. So 1 megahertz is equal to 10 to the 6th, or 1 million hertz.
So I can use my conversion factor to cancel out megahertz by multiplying by 10 to the 6th, and I get 8.5 times 10 to the 8th hertz, or seconds to the negative 1. Now I can rearrange my equation here to solve for wavelength, lambda, by dividing both sides by the frequency, or nu. And then I can substitute in my speed of light and my frequency. And you'll see that in terms of units, my seconds to the negative 1 actually cancel out. So I get 2.998 times 10 to the 8th divided by 8.5 times 10 to the 8th. I'm left with units of meters, and the wavelength for this radio wave is 0 0.35 meters. The way that waves interact when they meet is very different than the way that particles interact when they meet. So waves can actually add together when they meet to form new wave patterns. And to illustrate this, we have two sets of waves that are combining with each other. On the right, we actually have two waves that are depicted at the bottom here that are in alignment with each other. And what this means is that the peak on one wave is lining up with the peak on the other wave. And in the same way, the trough on one wave lines up with the trough on the other wave. So when we add these two waves together, the peaks combine and the troughs combine. They reinforce each other. And we end up with a new wave at the top here that has twice the amplitude, or the combined amplitude of the two waves that add together. This is known as constructive interference. Now on the right, we have another set of waves that are adding together, but these are out of alignment. So now the peak on one wave is lining up with the trough on the other. And what this means is that when we add these two waves together, the peak and the trough essentially cancel each other out. And the combined results is no wave at all. This is known as destructive interference. So this ability of waves to add together can lead to some really interesting interference patterns. The classic experiment that was done to prove that light actually behaved as a wave is based upon these interference patterns. It's known as the double slit experiment and it was per first performed by Thomas Young in 1801. And in the experiment, light from a single light source is allowed to pass through two narrow slits in a barrier. Now, as light passes through a narrow slit, it spreads out. So the beam becomes more diffuse or covers a wider area, um, the farther away from the slit that you get, sort of like this diagram here. This is just a characteristic of the way waves actually interact with matter. They tend to bend around matter, um, and we get uh, patterns that are known as diffraction. That's the bending pattern associated with light interacting with matter. So this diffraction happens for one slit, but it also happens for two slits we'll just get two beams of light that tend to spread out. And eventually, uh, those beams of light, as they spread out, will start to overlap. And where the waves overlap, you can get interference, constructive and destructive. They'll add together. So what Young did was that he actually placed a screen to display the light as those two beams of light actually started to interact with each other. 
and what he saw displayed on the screen was an interference pattern. Even though he only had two beams of light shining on the screen, what he saw was actually multiple bright spots, many more than just the two that you would expect associated with the two slits. And these bright spots were separated by multiple dark spots. So this type of light pattern could only result if light were behaving as a wave and the waves were actually adding together. So the bright spots indicate areas of constructive interference where the light waves added together. And the dark spots are areas of destructive interference where the light waves canceled each other out. So Thomas Young provided proof that light behaves as waves back in 1801. But in the early 20th century, Albert Einstein proposed that light also behaved as particles. And the basis for his argument was the photoelectric effect. So the photoelectric effect describes a phenomenon that had been observed between light and the surface of a metal. Metals, when exposed to light, emit electrons. And the theory was that when light hits the surface of the metal, that energy is absorbed by the electrons in the atoms at the surface. And if the electrons absorb enough energy from the light, um, they can overcome their binding energy and break free from the surface. Now, the troubling component of the photoelectric effect, however, was that only light above a certain threshold frequency would cause the effect. So shorter wavelength light, like uh, green and violet light, had no problem getting electrons ejected from the surface. But red light, no matter how bright or how long it was, shown on the surface could never get electrons ejected. And this just didn't match the classical wave understanding of light because the energy of light was supposed to be related to the intensity or brightness or amplitude of the wave. But the strongest, most intense red light would never produce electrons, while the weakest, dimmest blue light could get some really fast moving electrons ejected from the surface of the metal. So Einstein argued that in this instance, light should be viewed as a stream of particles, which we now call photons. An electron could be ejected from the surface of the metal if it were hit by a photon with enough energy. And that action of knocking an electron off the surface is inherently a particle-like behavior. It's like knocking a can off a fence by throwing rocks at it. Those rocks have to collide with the can to knock it off. And Einstein argued that in order for light to collide with an electron, it would have to behave as a particle. He also argued that the energy of the light uh, of the light particle as it collided determined the velocity of the electron as it was ejected. So the higher the energy of the particle, the greater the speed of the electron after collision. And he drew upon the work of Max Planck, who was also working with uh, uh, light to relate energy of the photon particles to the frequency of the light, not to amplitude or brightness. So the higher the frequency of the light, the more energetic the photons. Einstein won the Nobel Prize in 1921 for this work. And I have to make clear, it does not disprove the wave nature of light. Light still behaves as a wave and produces diffraction patterns like those seen in Thomas Young's experiment. But light also behaves as a particle. And this wave-particle duality for light 
quite honestly, is something that's still not fully understood today. But this dual nature allows us to explain phenomenon that couldn't be explained by light waves alone. So we can use our equation relating energy of photons to frequency and the frequency and wavelength of light to the speed of light to figure out the energy associated with any particular wavelength of light. So for example, in this problem, we have a surgical laser that produces light with a wavelength of 6.71 times 10 to the negative seventh meters. We want to know what the energy is of one photon of light from this laser. So in our equations, um, the first equation, E photon is the energy of a photon in units of joules. The um, H stands for a constant known as Planck's constant, and it's always 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds. And of course, the Greek letter nu is our frequency in hertz or seconds to the negative one. In the second formula, we know that uh, C equals the speed of light, 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, and lambda is our wavelength in units of meters. Now we want to relate wavelength to energy. So our equation for energy has frequency, not wavelength, but we can just rearrange our second e equation to isolate frequency. It equals C divided by wavelength. And we can substitute this into our first equation for frequency. And when we do that, we get the energy of a photon is equal to Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength of light. And now we can substitute all the information we have into this. And we get 6.626 times 10 to the negative 4, uh, excuse me, negative 34 joules times seconds times 2.998 times 10 to the 8th meters per second divided by 6.71 times 10 to the negative 7th meters. And notice what happens to the units. Seconds times seconds to the negative 1 will cancel out. Meters divided by meters will also cancel out. The only units that we're left with are joules. And our final answer is 2.96 times 10 to the negative 19 joules associated with one photon of light for this laser. So in summary, light behaves as a wave with characteristic interference patterns and wavelength and frequency relationships. Light also behaves as a particle with an energy that depends on the frequency of the light. And the wave-particle duality for light allows us to explain observations of matter that can't be explained by a wave model alone. We'll explore one of these phenomenon, the bright line emission spectra produced by elements in more depth, particularly with respect to how it led to the development of the Bohr model of the atom, which helps set the stage for the quantum mechanical model.